Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. I want to teach this weekend on how to release God's power in your life. How to release God's power in your life. Let me ask a question. Are any of you believing God to be weak? Which do you want? Do you want power or do you want weakness? <laughs> is power really available to us? And what kind of power is available to us? You know, we know that God is powerful, but can we actually share in his power in our lives? The Bible says, if the same power that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you, and it does, it will quicken your mortal body. Now, what does that mean? It'll make you strong. It will energize you. It will activate you. It will enable you. Now, listen to me. It will enable you to do what Whatever you need to do in life without murmuring, without complaining, without murmuring, without complaining, uh oh, without murmuring, without complaining, it will enable you and me to do whatever we need to do in life. How many of you have noticed that not every day? turns out the way you'd like it to. <laughs> and sometimes you might have a few months or even a whole year that doesn't turn out the way that you would like it to. And in those times, we have to hold firm and be steady and fight that good fight of faith and not let the enemy steal from us the hope and the vision that we have for our life because of what we have found as promises in the Word of God. And even in those difficult times, we can still treat people good. We can still have a smile on our face. We can still walk in peace. Not by our own power, but by the power of God. Not only is God powerful, but he wants to fill us, fill us, fill us, fill us with his power. And I want you to understand not only here in this place tonight, but all around the world, that you do not have to live a weak, wimpy, pitiful, pathetic, barely get by life. Jesus came that we might have and enjoy our life and have it in abundance to the full until it overflows. I cannot promise you a problem-free life. I cannot promise you a faith, no matter how great your faith is, that does not insulate you from ever having problems. Matter of fact, sometimes when we make a bold stand to serve God, that's when the enemy really comes against us and tries to steal that faith. The Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 16, 9, that a wide door of opportunity had opened unto him, and with it came many, many adversaries. So I'm not going to tell you that you're going to have a problem-free life, but I will tell you that you already are more than a conqueror through Christ who loves you. Already are more than a conqueror. You don't have to try to be. You already are. All you need to do is learn how to believe that and walk in it. Because you know what? No matter what God has offered us through his son, Jesus Christ, and what he's offered us is quite amazing. It is never released in our life if we don't believe it. So I just want to ask you tonight, do you believe that God's power is available to you to help you do whatever you need to do in life with a reasonable amount of joy and peace and that no matter what's going on in your circumstances, that you can still be a blessing to other people? Do you believe that the power of God has, is available to you for that kind of a life. Yeah. Amen. Well then, if we believe it's available, then we need to make sure that we know how to appropriate it, how to release it in our lives. Because you know, it's fun to come to something like this and hear somebody tell you all about this. But the thing is, and I tell people this pretty much in every conference, you're going to have a great time here, but you have to go home. 
I would like to say that we're going to do some magic thing this weekend, and boy, when you go home, everything is going to be changed, and you're not going to have the same problems you had when you came here, but we all know that that's not going to happen. <laughs> However, you can change, and I can change, and those of you watching by television, no matter where you're at in the world, you can change. We're always wanting God to change our circumstances, but the fact is, He's more interested in changing us than He is in changing our circumstances. Because when we change, the more we become like Christ, and the more of the power of the Holy Spirit we walk in, the less we are going to be concerned about our circumstances. And listen to what I'm going to say. When we learn to stop being so concerned about our circumstances, then and only then the devil will go and find somebody to bother that he can upset. But in order to qualify for the power of God, you must first come to a place where you realize that in and of yourself, you are weak. You have weaknesses. You have limitations. God has no limitations, but we have limitations. <laughs> Apart from Him, we can do nothing of any real value. Now, I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven scriptures that we're going to look at to get us convinced that our weaknesses really don't have to make that much difference if we know how to let God fill our weaknesses with His power. We get too overwrought about what we can't do, and we don't get excited enough about what God can do. You see, no matter what you can't do or what I can't do, God can do. And miracles don't come in can'ts, they come in cans. Amen? So we want to get rid of the I can't word. We want to get rid of the it's too hard phrase. It's too much for me. I can't do this. I can't stand this. Because as a matter of fact, if we are indeed filled with that resurrection power that Paul talked about in Philippians chapter 3, he said, I want to know him and the power of his resurrection that lifts me out from among the dead even while I'm in the body. So what was he saying? There's a power available to us that no matter what is going on around us, we can be lifted above it. You know, an eagle, and in the first scripture we're going to look at, which is Isaiah 40, the Bible says that we can mount up with wings as eagles. Well, what does that really mean? You know, an eagle is not afraid of a storm. Matter of fact, they have what's called tunnel vision, and they can see a storm coming from miles and miles and miles away. We need to have enough discernment that we're not taken by surprise and we can sense, even before the full attack is on, what the enemy is trying to do, and already set our mind before the whole problem starts that we're going to come out the winner on the other end. To be more than a conqueror means that you know you've got the victory before you ever get the problem. Can anybody have enough confidence in this place to know that before... So see, you don't have to live in fear of what's going to happen tomorrow. You don't have to live in fear of what's going to happen in these last days. So many people ask me now what my input is on the last days. And I just tell them, frankly, I'm not an expert in end times. I do have enough sense to not try to get into something that I don't feel that I'm qualified to get into. I have a very simple philosophy about it. Maybe it's too simple for you. Maybe you'd like to worry about it. If you want to, you can. But... My simple philosophy is that if I trust God and to the best of my ability I do what I believe He's asking me to do, then He is going to take care of me. And if I am more than a conqueror, then I can have the confidence right now that whatever happens in the end times, that we can handle it. That's what it means to be more than a conqueror. You don't have to be afraid of what's going to happen tomorrow or what's going to happen when you retire or what's going to happen with this, that, or something else because you say, I'm in Christ, and that same power that raised Christ from the dead dwells in me, and I 
can do, I can do whatever I need to do through Christ who strengthens me. I can do. Not I can't, but I can. Just take a pause break and give God a big shout. Isaiah 40, verse 29. I decided I'm just going to have you look at every one of these scriptures because I think sometimes we rush around too fast and I can quote them all to you, but I want you to see them. Isaiah 40, 29, and today it's so easy, we put it up on the overhead for you. You don't even have to try to find it. He gives power to the faint and the weary. And to him who has no might, he increases strength, causing it to multiply and making it to abound. So you see, even if you walked in here tonight feeling like I am at the end of my rope, then you can depend on God to give you power, refresh you in this place tonight, and send you out ready to start all over again and not give up. He gives power to the faint and the weary. He doesn't give power to the powerful. He gives power to those who need power. And God doesn't give us his power for nothing. God's not going to give us his power so we can sit around on church pews until our bottoms get flat and do absolutely nothing but be a pew sitter. Amen? Verse 30, even youths, that means even really young people that are in great shape shall faint <laughs> and be weary and selected young men shall feebly stumble and fall exhausted. Now, that's not being negative. It's just saying that everybody has their limitations without God. No matter how young you are, no matter how great of a shape you're in, no matter how smart you think you are, no matter what you think you can do, you will ultimately display weakness in your life. And thank God for it, because if we didn't have any weakness, then we wouldn't need Him. Amen? Amen? So God leaves weaknesses in every one of us. So we will constantly cry out to God, God, I need you and I'm nothing without you. But those who wait for the Lord, and waiting for God doesn't mean to sit around passively doing nothing. Actually, waiting on God is to be very spiritually active. You're praying, you're seeking God, you're loving God, you're obeying God but you're refusing to get into what the Bible calls works of the flesh, trying to make your own way, because you learn that if you don't have his plan, your plan is not going to work. Has anybody ever tried to work your own plan and just made your problem a whole lot worse? Well, of course, we've all tried that. That's one of the ways that we find out that we need to lean on God. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength, and power, they shall lift up their wings and mount up close to God as eagles mount up to the sun. They shall run and not be weary. Don't you love that? They shall run and not be weary. They shall handle anything that comes their way and not get weary and worn out and exhausted and feel like I just can't take it. But we can actually have the kind of life where other people look at us and say, I don't know how you can be that happy with what's going on in your life. How can you just keep reaching out to other people with all the problems you have in your own life? And you say, well, it's not by my might and power, but it's by his. Now, the eagle sees a storm coming a long way off, but it takes advantage of the storm. You see, storms in our life do have an advantage because they force us to seek God. They force us to seek God. How many of you have found out that when you get a problem so big that you finally figure out that it's way over your head, then and only then do we normally seek God with our whole heart? It's amazing how much time we find for God, how much time we find to pray and seek God and read the Word when we are desperate. 
It's amazing how little time we have when everything's going good. But boy, we find all kinds of time to seek God when things are desperate. So I learned from God a long time ago. He said, just act like you're desperate all the time, and then you won't actually be desperate <laughs> at any time. Because really, we are desperate, actually. <laughs> we are just a total, complete wreck and a mess without God. So the eagle waits for this storm, and when, when the, the storm hits, it bounces him up, and he mounts up close to the sun, as we should let the storms help us mount up close to God. And the eagle literally flies around above the storm and can look down at it and wait for it to pass. We do that when we're in airplanes. Sometimes you've got to get through the storm, and that's a little bumpy, but then when you can get above it, you're up in this place where it's just so peaceful and calm, and you're just looking down at it, waiting for it to pass. And that's the way God wants us to live. He wants us to not be afraid of those storms. You know, I don't know about you, but I finally got tired of worrying about what was going to happen next. Amen? It's wonderful to not have to be afraid of whatever's going to happen next because you know that you know that you know that God is in control and that He does work all things out for our good if we continue to love Him and trust Him. How wonderful it is to have that confidence. In Psalm chapter 6, verse 2, the psalmist David said, Have mercy on me and be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am weak, faint, and withered away. <laughs> o Lord, heal me, for my bones are troubled. So David, the great psalmist David, who became a great king, had no problem saying, In and of myself, I am weak. There's nothing that I can do without God. You see, people who think they've got it all together can't really have God's help. You have to wait and wear yourself out first. Matter of fact, I really believe, and I've talked to somebody at length about this in the last few months, because this person struggled quite a bit for many years and now has had a real encounter with God and everything has changed for them and the question has been well why now why not two years ago why not five years ago and I said I really believe that God was waiting for you to come to the end of yourself <laughs> you know sometimes we say God I can't do it but we really don't mean it because the next morning we get another plan <laughs> come on we get another bright idea about how we're going to fix this. And so then God has to wait again for us to realize that's not going to work. You know, when Abraham and Sarah were waiting for the promised child, they got tired of waiting like a lot of us do. And so they got a bright idea. You take my hand, maiden. Have intercourse with her. She can be your secondary wife. I don't know what wife in her right mind would give her husband a secondary wife. I mean, that's just trouble brewing from the get-go right there. And sure enough, she did get pregnant, and then that caused all kinds of problems between Hagar and Sarah. And then she had a baby. And so it was another 13 years of waiting added on to what they already probably would have been waiting now trying to deal with the mess they created by trying to fix their own problem. Boy, do we ever need to learn how to not move in the flesh, but to move in the spirit. When God says move, we move, and when he says stop, we stop. When he says wait, we wait, and when he says go, we go. We have to come to the end of ourselves, and sometimes, depending on your temperament, how you're put together, how full of yourself you are. <laughs> that takes longer for some people than others. Do you think that, well, I'm a strong person. I can, I don't, do you have trouble taking help from people? Do you have trouble asking people for help? Do you have trouble letting go? Are you stubborn? 
proud. You know, the Bible talks about something that we don't really like to talk about much. It's something called brokenness. And that's kind of like a people of faith just kind of think that's a dirty word. It's like. But the truth is, God has to break the outer man. Just like the woman who came with the alabaster box full of sweet perfume to anoint Jesus, she had to break the box. She had to break the jar. <laughs> and there's a lot of great things in us that Christ has put in us by His grace. We didn't do anything to get them, but at the new birth, He put them in us. And He wants those things to come out of us and to be shared with other people and for us to glorify Him. But if that sweet, wonderful thing that God has done in us is encased and enclosed in a stubborn flesh, then that flesh has to be dealt with. And many of you, some of the things that you're going through right now in your life that you absolutely hate and despise, someday you will find out that these problems were indeed your very best friend. <laughs> you don't believe me now, but check with me in 10 years. Come on now. How many of you have gone through some wretched things in your past, but if you look back, man, you can say, that's what brought me close to God. Yeah. Now, the fact of the matter is, you could be that close to God without having to get it that way. But, you know, it's just, it just kind of comes with the package. I mean, we're stubborn. We're proud. We want to do it ourselves. We, we want to take the credit. It's hard to totally lean on anybody. Matthew 26, 41, when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane and asking his disciples to pray with him, can you not pray with me one hour? They kept falling asleep. And he said, get up and pray. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So you see, no matter how many good intentions I have, and really, no matter how many victories I've had in the past, that doesn't guarantee me a victory today if I'm not leaning on God today. Right. Leaning on God yesterday doesn't help me today. I have to lean on God today. Yeah. I suggest starting every day saying, God, I am absolutely nothing without you. I can do nothing without you. I lean entirely on you today. I am desperate without your help. Not get up and say, I, I got this piece of cake. No problem. No time to pray this morning. Got to rush on, do my plan. Do you know that spending time with God honors Him? And I might even go on to say, I think it's quite insulting to Him when we don't spend time with God because really what we're saying, in essence, is I don't need you. <laughs> I mean, come on, don't look at me like that. <laughs> well, no, I, I don't, I'm just busy. Well, you know what? If you get a big enough problem, you're not too busy for God. Come on, am I telling the truth? You get a big enough problem, you're not too busy for God. And, you know, some of us can get that after two or three times around the mountain. I wasn't like that. I needed about a thousand trips until I finally got it. Apart from you, I can do nothing. Now, when I come to that point, now I am a candidate for God's power. But I'm not going to have that power until I know that I have to have it to survive. Well, now remember, the first step to releasing God's power in our lives is recognizing our own weaknesses. Extreme poverty is a huge problem in this area just outside of Hyderabad, India. But there are two young girls that we want to tell you about. Their names are Bhavana and Nandini, and they are facing something that is so difficult. The fact is, 
they are girls. And that's basically all it takes. My name is Nanni. I'm studying in fourth class. I have nine years old. My name is Priya Bhavana. I'm studying in ninth class. Uh, I, I am uh, 14 years old. 14 years old. What kind of problems are, are your family facing? My father is not there in my home. He is swimming outside. నేను <laughs> God is taking care of you. Yes, uh, God is taking care about me in all my uh, necessities and he is giving me very good health. Then what do you like to do together? Uh, we will pray together every day and we'll pray, play every day. Whenever we have time, we'll make funny jokes, we'll sit, uh, study and we'll learn about God. What does it mean to you when you come here to visit and you see your daughters are happy? Ankutun sir, ni nankun na tirgo umturu umnaru pillalu sar devalla devni krupa valla ipparvar ko manchu umnaru inka manchu um ala na kun na badalan hoti sir. As I'm sure you know, there are many parts of the world where simply being born a girl and not a boy makes life very difficult. India is one of those places. Together we can make a difference, and we are. The girls that you see behind me are part of our Hand of Hope sponsored children's home. And we're able to not only keep them in a safe place, an environment that is loving, but to let them know that what society says about them is not true, that it's what God says about them that matters. They are valuable and they are loved. You are helping make this possible. Don't ever look at a situation and think it's too big to make a change. Together, we are making a change, and we thank you for being part of it.